be back over it on this without rest or sleep. 150 miles of holding back of six vindictive mules and keeping them from climbing the trees. It sounds incredible, but I remember the statement well enough. The station keepers, hostlers, etc., were low, rough characters, as already described, and from western Nebraska to Nevada, a considerable sprinkling of them might be fairly set down as outlaws, fugitives, fugitives from justice, criminals whose best security was a section of country which was without law and without even the pretense of it. When the division agent issued an order to one of these parties, he did it with the full understanding that he might have to enforce it with a Navy six-shooter, and so he always went fixed to make things go along smoothly. Now and then a division agent was really obliged to shoot a hostler through the head to teach him some simple matter that he could have taught him with a club if his circumstances and surroundings had been different. But they were snappy, able men, those division agents, and when they tried to teach a subordinate anything, the subor that subordinate generally got it through his head. A great portion of this vast machinery, these hundreds of men and coaches, and thousands of mules and horses, was in the hands of Mr. Ben Holliday. All the western half of the business was in his hands. This reminds me of an incident of Palestine travel, which is pertinent here. And so I will transfer it just in the language in which I find it set down in my Holy Land notebook. No doubt everybody has heard of Ben Holliday, a man of prodigious energy, who used to send mails and passengers flying across the continent in his overland stagecoaches like a very whirlwind. 2,000 long miles in 15 days and a half by the watch. But this fragment of history is not about Ben Holliday, but about a young New York boy by the name of Jack, who traveled with our small party of pilgrims in the Holy Land and who had traveled to California in Mr. Holliday's overland coaches three years before and had, and had by no means forgotten it or lost his gushing admiration of Mr. H. Aged 19, Jack was a good boy, a good-hearted and always well-meaning boy who had been reared in the city of New York, and although he was bright and knew a great many useful things, his scriptural education had been a good deal neglected to such a degree, indeed, that all Holy Land history was fresh and new to him, and all Bible names myster mysteries that had never disturbed his virgin ear. <clears throat> also in our party was an elderly pilgrim who was the reverse of Jack, in that... Yeah. What is that? That's a siren. In that he was learned in the scriptures. And Daddy, is that police or fireman uh, or an so. ambulance? I, I'm never quite sure until I see him. I think it's an ambulance. Could be. Or a fireman. Okay, or a police. Yeah, it could be. It could be a low-flying deck. Okay. No way, Jose. In that he was learned in the scriptures and an enthusiast concerning them. He was our encyclopedia, and we were never tired of listening to his speeches, nor he of making them. He never passed a celebrated locality from Bashan to Bethlehem without illuminating it with an oration. One day, when camped near the ruins of Jericho, he burst forth with something like this. Jack, do you see that range of mountains over yonder that bounds the Jordan Valley? The mountains of Moab, Jack, think of it, my boy. The actual mountains of Moab, renowned in scripture history. We're actually standing face to face with those illustrious crags and peaks. And for all we know, dropping his voice impressively, our eyes may be resting at this very moment upon the spot where lies the mysterious grave of Moses. Think of it, Jack. Moses who? Falling inflection. Moses who, Jack? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. You ought to be ashamed of such criminal ignorance. Why, Moses, the great guide, soldier, poet, lawgiver of ancient Israel. Jack, from this spot where we stand to Egypt stretches a fearful desert 300 miles in extent. 
And across that desert, that wonderful man brought the children of Israel, guiding them with unfailing sagacity for 40 years over the sandy desolation and among the obstructing rocks and hills, and landed them at last, safe and sound within sight of this very spot. And where we now stand, they entered the promised land with anthems of rejoicing. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing to do, Jack. Think of it. Forty years, only three hundred miles? Hmm. Ben Holiday would have fetched them through in thirty-six hours. He did not know that he had said anything that was wrong or irreverent. And so no one scolded him or felt offended with him. And nobody could but some ungenerous spirit incapable of excusing the heedless blunders of a boy. At noon on the fifth day out, we arrived at the crossing of the South Platte, alias Julesburg, alias Overland City, 470 miles from St. Joseph, the strangest, quaintest, funniest frontier town that our untraveled eyes had ever stared at and been astonished with. Chapter 7 Overland City Crossing the Platte Bemis's Buffalo Hunt Assault by a Buffalo Bemis's Horse Goes Crazy An Impromptu Circus A New Departure Bemis Finds Refuge in a Tree Escapes Finally by a Wonderful Method It did seem strange enough to see a town again, after what appeared to us such a long acquaintance with deep still, almost lifeless and houseless solitude. We tumbled out into the busy street, feeling like meteoric people crumbled off the corner of some other world, and wakened up suddenly in this. For an hour we took as much interest in Overland City as if we had never seen a town before. The reason we had an hour to spare was because we had to change our stage for a less sumptuous affair called a mud wagon and transfer our freight of mails. Presently we got underway again. We came to the shallow, yellow, muddy South Platte with its low banks and its scattering flat sandbars and pygmy islands a melancholy stream struggling through the center of the enormous flat plain that only saved from being impo impossible to find with the naked eye by its sentinel rank of scattering trees standing on either bank. The plat was up, they said, which made me wish I could see it when it was down. If it could look any sicker and sorrier, they said it was a dangerous stream to cross now because its quicksands were li liable to swallow up horses, coach, and passengers if an attempt was made to ford it. But the males had to go and we made the attempt. Once or twice in midstream the wheels sunk into the yielding sands so threateningly we have to believe we had dreaded and avoided the sea all our lives to be shipwrecked in a mud wagon in the middle of a desert at last. But we dragged through and sped away toward the setting sun. Next morning, just before dawn, when about 550 miles from St. Joseph, our mud wagon broke down. We were to be delayed five or six hours, and therefore we took horses by invitation and joined a noble sport galloping over the plain in the dewy freshness. <clears throat> and joined a party who were just starting on a buffalo hunt. It was noble sport galloping over the plain in the dewy freshness of the morning, but our part of the hunt ended in disaster and disgrace for a wounded buffalo bull chased the passenger Bemis nearly two miles, and then he forsook his horse and took to a lone tree. He was very sullen about the matter for some 24 hours, but at last he began to soften little by little, and finally he said, 
Well, it was not funny, and there was no sense in those gawks making themselves so facetious over it. I tell you, I was angry and earnest for a while. I should have shot that long, gangly lubber they called Hank if I could have done it without crippling six or seven other people. <laughs> but of course I could. The old Alan so confounded comprehensive. I wish those loafers had been up